is our Innovation in Chicago Dance, The Rhythm Makers. It's a public dialogue and info session from Chicago Dance Makers Forum. It's one of four public dialogues we're having this fall winter um, in relation to our 15th anniversary of the program, as well as um, uh, the launch of the open call for the 2018 Lab Artist Program. And those applications will be due in February. So we'll be talking a bit about the Lab Artist Program, but mostly about dance making. Um, and in the middle of today, uh, today's session, we'll have just a bit of information about the application process for 2018 and some other announcements. My name is Sean Lett. I'm the Program Director. Um, we'll also hear from some artists that we'll introduce. And Ginger Farley, will, um, the Executive Director of Chicago Dance Makers Forum, will be facilitating, uh, moderating today. Uh, but first, we are at American Rhythm Center, and we want to um, just hear from Lane Alexander, who is the director here. So. And a lab, former lab artist. Former lab artist. Thank, you. thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you, Ginger. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the American Rhythm Center. Uh, this is a program of the Chicago Human Rhythm Project, and we're really proud and happy to, to host this event here today with Hema and Natya Dance Theater as our co-hosts, so thank you very much. Um, the American Rhythm Center is actually a social enterprise uh, dedicated to economic justice for artists. Uh, most of the teachers and companies in residence here uh, are small business people, and the tuition that passes through the classes actually goes directly to the teachers as opposed to their being employees of a space. They're actually their own, their own business owner, small business owner, sometimes a single class, just to let you know what goes on at the American Rhythm Center. Um, as uh, Sean mentioned, I was a lab artist in 2004, I believe it was the second year of the pro the second year of the program, Shirley and I were um, co-lab artists that year as opposed to lab rats. We were lab artists. <laughs> and um, uh, I believe in the very first year of the program, another rhythm maker, Jimmy Payne Jr., another tap dancer, was uh, a lab artist. So a rhythm has a long history in the, in the CDF, and so we're really happy to have you all here today. I actually have four grants due the first three days of next week, so I'm going to go back upstairs to my office and work on my grants and turn it over to Ginger Farley, the Executive Director of the Chicago Dance Makers Forum. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you. I'm going to give this to you because I didn't. Yeah, but I'm going to talk first. So, so hi. This is a, no. I've got one. They, they put one on me. I'm the one, the only one with a special awesome. microphone. Awesome. Cool. So it's a little unusual for us to have television coverage for uh, for a, a community session like this. We're really thrilled to have Can TV, but we're still kind of not really used to working with the mic. So just uh, bear with us. Um, uh, so I'm Ginger Farley, welcome. I'm, I direct the Chicago Dance Makers Forum. Uh, I was also a lab artist in the initial year of this program, a former choreographer and dancer myself. Um, we're just really excited to have you all here and to uh, learn from and converse with Hema Rajagopalan of Natya and Jumani Taylor. Both um, Hema and Jumani uh, are Chicago Dance Makers Forum lab artists from different times, uh, Hema in 04. 04 and Jumani this year. Um, also Shirley Mordeen, a former uh, Chicago Dance Makers Forum lab artist is here. Um, we have kind of a small group and I think it would be really great if we just went around and said our names and passed the microphone and um, uh, just say one brief thing about, uh, about yourself. One, less than a sentence. <laughs> uh, I'm KJ and I'm a tap dancer here in Chicago. I'm Carmen Paquette, and I'm a tap dancer as well here in Chicago. Uh, I'm Tia Pinson, and I am an artist here in Chicago. Okay. I'm Dana. I'm the managing director of Natia Dance Theater. I'm Shirley Mordine, um, director of Mordine & Company Dance Theater. Roger Gopalan, my husband. I'm Vera Marie Baldoza. I'm an American Sign Language interpreter and enjoy dance. My name is Todd Everard, and I don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kristen. I'm with Alphawood Foundation. So, um, 
uh, for a number of years, Chicago Dance Makers Forum has been holding these sessions to inform people about the grant opportunity. But um, one of the important things that we do, in addition to running the Chicago Dance Makers Forum uh, Lab Artist Program and some public programs, is um, to engage, engage artists in dialogue with one another about ideas and about contemporary practices in dance making and um, to help build community and help people uh, learn from each other and know each other. So um, that's also part of the purpose of this gathering. So um, we asked both Hema and Jumani today if they would talk a little bit about their practices and how they think about innovation in the practice and the form that they work in in dance. So who wants to go first? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I practice in the, I always say the well being of, of tap dancing and its genre, and always using its best music, which to me is jazz music. So, within my practice, I'm always trying to uh, keep in mind. Uh, I guess keep some type of true matter in mind and to me the true matter is just growth and I'm growing and I'm progressing when I'm dancing and when I'm practicing um, so within that mind state I, I, I can feel myself growing and, and, and advancing anytime I'm practicing and I'm not just talking about technical practice or you know repetitive rudiments but really having a mindset um, going into the studio or, or having a mindset when putting my shoes on um, and going about the dance, the tap dancing. It's really uh, a progressive practice for me whenever I, uh, yeah, whenever I put the metal to the floor. <laughs> and um, I've been here since 1974 and my art form is very rooted in a very traditional classical art form which is called Bharatanatyam and people in 1974 were not so familiar as they are now. It's quite, um, quite familiar, people are, many people know about it. And it is from India and of course uses the traditional um, parameters. But what's very important to me is to being in Chicago. I met with so many art forms, uh, whether I saw or whether I had the opportunity to collaborate with and also being influenced by um, artists that I see. And that, that to me is, is phenomenal because I think tap dance or ballet or modern, uh, Shirley Modine is here, I've collaborated with her. I've collaborated with the uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, uh, which is totally classical. And I've collaborated with jazz musicians as well, Doug uh, Lofstrom and his quartet. So. To me, I think um, even though it is when we, what we mean by classical is very fine art. So um, when we innovate within our tradition, within our parameters, within our sensibilities, it reaches out and embraces, I think, influenced by other cultures. So my presentation of this art form is very contemporary, it's with a contemporary sensibility. So I always say, what do we say, Dana? Uh, that, no, yeah, that well, we are a classical dance theater, but being contemporary is our tradition. So that's what I say. And I just came back from India uh, today, in fact, and, uh, <laughs> and, and it was amazing to see that I was on a panel and Mark Morris was the person who in inaugurated the festival. And, um, and Mark, uh, I believe, I never knew that, has been coming to India very often and is very influenced by Carnatic music, surely. And we, we've had the honor of being uh, collaborating with Ravi Kiran, the Carnatic musician. So Mark was saying that he's very much influenced by, uh, that's why he comes very often and hears a lot of music. So. Music is a very important part of Mark's choreography. So he uses live musicians and he's very influenced by that. So I think when I see and hear other artists and, um, and Chicago has been great in that respect for me because that you know, really has advanced my art form, I would say. 
Can you, both of you work in uh, forms that are both responding to music and are making music. And um, can you talk a little bit about um, composition versus response versus improvisation? Shoot, that's so heavy. <laughs> no, it's so great. Because those are the things that, I'm, that I usually go through in my own mind regularly. Um, when dancing to live music or recorded music, what decisions are going to fit best uh, with the music at hand? Especially with jazz music, there's so many di different decisions that can be made with, um, with improvisation. So I think I am able to make a decision only with the consistent study of of, of that music, or any music really, but particularly jazz for me, I have to, I have to keep a consistent rotation of like the John Coltrane's and the Miles Davis records or the Sarah Vaughan tunes and the Ella Fitzgerald rhythms and all those different rotations to have some type of uh, intelligent interpretation when I am um, improvising with the tap dancing and it's, it's completely different, but so much the same. And I, I guess I use the similarities to create the dancing. And the similarities aren't just, or it's not just the rhythm, but it's also the musicalities of the, of the artist, the John Coltrane's, the Miles Davis, and what have you, uh, the melodies. There's so much more that those men and women, since they've composed genius uh, records and genius standards, those things really help me. Uh, yeah, well, they, they teach me. They, they teach me, because, yeah, because I, I still remember those, those, uh, those licks or those melodies, and I can use those ideas or use those ways, those highs and those lows to uh, improvise infinitely sometimes, you know? I know you know. Yes, and uh, in our art form, uh, composition is very important. Poetry is very important because we improvise all the time on the lyrics. So the lyrics are very important, so the poems. So the dancer usually improvises on the poems. So it's visual poetry, basically. So then uh, poetry already, uh, which is written, is then put into music. So the musicality is a very important thing, as uh, Jamani talked about. The musicality of the artist that's singing is very important. So the orchestra, whether it's the vocalist or the violinist or the flutist or the percussionist, so all this brings together. So what comes first in our dance? Is it the dance or is it the music? So sometimes it's the dance itself and sometimes it's the music. So then you have to have the combination of both. So you have to have the live musicians in front of the choreographer in order to really create that magic. And of course that magic really happens on the stage with the live musicians because the musicality of the dance comes in. So the critics usually say that it is the artist as a consummate artist that can really tap into the musicality of the art form. So that's very important. So improvisation is the key to our dance in the sense that the emotional um, improvisations, the feelings are interpreted in different ways. So the words are used, so it's in different Indian languages, and those are given visual interpretations and which the, which the audience has to understand. So for me, it is diverse audiences, so it becomes doubly challenging for me to use Sanskrit or Tamil or any Indian language, for example. So I really have to give, get the essence of the composition and then improvise and use my musicians to give a musical interpretation of the art form. So, um I want to kind of open it up to others to see if you have thoughts or questions or uh, things that come out of your own practice that you want to dialogue with Jumani and Hema about. 
Oh, Hema and I have, uh, have had many collaborations. Our first one was a quartet of two duets to a Bill Evans piano piece, one of the most beautiful pieces you ever want to hear. And we called it Two Rivers. And we just acted out, in a sense, these two rivers and then began to explore when these two rivers connected. So that became a metaphor for the choreography. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that was our first one. And then the second one, uh, I was working in the studio with Hamas Dancer and one of my dancers. And I had this image, and it came from, I, I usually work from a point of view of observation image, so there's something outside of it, not just me. It connects to the world, it connects to life, experience. And I had this image of some, something going on endlessly, endlessly. And out of that, from God knows where, the universe, another voice comes into it, which is almost a metaphor for an older form, a new form. And this voice came into it, and they, uh, in a sense, have a collision of what their material and their sensibility is. And then it transforms, so the older one leaves and the newer one stays and evolves further. But that's a metaphor of uh, uh, evolution of, of an art form, so to speak. So that was our, and Hema came in one day and said, surely this is Sahridaya. Uh, what does that mean? Empathy. My God, if we don't have anything in our art form, it's empathy, how you feel in two. You have to have that. So that was Sahridaya. And we went on and did more, pushed to the edge. <laughs> A lot of them. What was our last one? Yeah, but when we did it at the North Shore Center for the Arts? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, that's my, I don't have anything else right now. If you could both um, sp speak to um, innovation and its connection to the past a little bit, yeah. and maybe even sp what you're talking about, Shirley, uh, through the voice, but also through the body. So uh, maybe connection, what is the connection to the past to innovation? What it, where is the root, the branch? What is that for you? And I think it connects a little bit to what you were speaking. I think I wanted to say that this is a Chicago Dance Makers Forum. I think it's a fantastic idea, whoever uh, started it. I don't know whose idea it was, but whatever it was, it was absolutely wonderful. Because it gives the artist a chance to think and innovate. In a, you know, it's like pushing you to do something in one way. So this is exactly what happened uh, many years ago. I was actually in a, I was sharing an office space with another dancer, Jan Bartosek. And we had our offices right in front of each other, and we used to. And at that time, I didn't, we didn't know each other. We just said hello in the middle and uh, said, OK, what do you do? And what do you? So that's how it started. So I think art for anybody, if artists are going to innovate, she said, how do you move? And I said, well, I move this way. This is what the art form is. And I sa she said, oh, you know, in contemporary modern, this is what I do. And then we started a conversation. And that conversation led to a work called Conversation. So we created a dance called Conversation. And then it went on to Conversation 1 and Conversation 2. Then we added music to it, and we presented it on the stage. So your process. Oh. <laughs> from the past. OK, yeah, from the past. Well, I guess I'm trying to think about also using the past or using historical gems or historical treasures to innovate and to create work. I do that, I have to do that every day. Uh, I have to think about the Sammy Davis Jr.'s, Gregory Hines. Uh, I can list millions if you would like, but <laughs> I have to do that in order to continue. Uh, that is what the art form itself has taught me to do. That's yeah, not directly, I guess maybe indirectly, I'm not really sure, maybe through relationship, maybe through time, but it, it roots, yeah, it, it has taught me, um, yes, how, how, how to continue in tap dance. I'm very particular on how I create work. I don't create a lot of work on my own because I'm, I'm very picky. My, my first work, I believe, was recreated four or five times because I'm very particular of, well, 
you know, Jimmy Slide respect this? Will uh, Lois Bright and the, you know, the Miller brothers respect this? Will the Nicholas brothers respect this? You know, so thinking about all those things, praying about all those things really keeps me in a, in, in a I guess, a kind of a balanced place, at least for my spirit, uh, when trying to connect honestly with this art form and with those uh, historical gems and treasures. I, I don't know, I, I really think a lot and, and uh, dig a lot into myself, into, uh, into prayer uh, when innovating and when creating dance. Oh, Sean. Um, you both work within some very deeply rooted art forms and there's a lot of tradition behind that. But as innovators, I wonder if both of you were to look forward to your vision of the future of your form, what would be one thing you would want to emphasize and bring to the fore for that future? Gosh, what would I like to emphasize? My thing has been authenticity of the form because uh, it's very difficult. Oh, not he, difficult. he sounds like he's taking everything. It's all about Pantanato, the way he talks about it. <laughs> not about something outside itself. It might take that stimulus, but ultimately it's what my voice comes through with, or my dancers and I, because I work very carefully interacting with my dancers, because I want them to have a voice. You know, if, if you were an actor on stage, you wouldn't just get up there and re repeat lines someone gave you. That's not performance. So the, the dancers themselves have to, I work with them to evolve their roles, and then they really have a voice and a stake in it. Yeah, I think uh, what Shirley means is yes, we do that too. I think we want, we all, we both of us want to have our own voices. Our dancers need to have voices. But there's a very deep, uh, what should I say, tradition on which we are rooted and we take our influence from there and then move on, you know? This raises actually a really interesting question for me because you have, in a form that is traditional, you have a, a, a deep well of material which provides information for discernment yes. about whether or not you're, the work that you're doing is aligned with or meets the standards of or yes. whatever. And in, and in innovation, uh, where is that? Where is that found? What's the, what's the criteria for discernment, right? I mean, I think that's an interesting question in a form that's and both rooted in, in classical oh, yeah issues, but also in, in forms that are much more contemporary or more recently surfacing. Yes. I think we are more, much, I think we classical dancers are much more challenged on that part where we say, okay, are we innovating? Because we're always innovating, but we have to be, are we, I, I just talked about it in India, are we pushing the envelope? Are we breaking, uh, pushing the barrier? Are we breaking the boundaries or pushing the boundaries, what are we doing, you know? So I seem to think that we, in some way, form or the other, I think we are breaking, bar breaking boundaries, you know? We may be thinking we are pushing the boundaries, but we're actually breaking the boundaries in some way, form or the other. Um, so we do have parameters that we have to think about, but our, you know, words that we have to think about are authenticity and the rootedness, where we come from, and definitely is innovative. But as Shirley would put it, I think, is it reachable? Is it a voice that we are, are we using that voice to connect? Is, is our work, uh, you know, uh, is our work really reaching the audience? Are they relating to us? Or is it just something that they can't relate to? Then it doesn't become an art form. Yeah. Back to the, yes, innovating and when is it like, 
hold on, you know, you're pushing too, or going too far. Uh, again, I, I, have to, I have to stay thinking and remembering those, those, uh, those master teachers, is what I like to call them. And earlier I mentioned that there were millions that I could have named, but there are only like a handful of, I guess, what we would call hoofers. Uh, hoofers, uh, the original hoofers, are only a handful of those individuals that really kept the well-being of, of tap dance strong and present and, and would share it within the community uh, in, in, in the most honest way. Um, shoot, there was something else I want to say about that, but I guess the difference in what the hoofers were doing, I. I guess would be like a Bojangles versus the Nicholas Brothers, if you have any idea of, of who those individuals were. The Nicholas Brothers would incorporate lots of flash, splits, turns, and Bojangles would incorporate, I believe, more rhythm. Some tap dancers would just say more beats to the bar. Um, and I am more... And more, more spectacle was the beats. Say that again. Yeah, okay. definitely more gymnastics. And that to me seemed a, a bit like a fusion of, of genres. That didn't seem as authentic to me. But the Nicholas Brothers and the Four Step Brothers and uh, Tip Tap and Toe and, and countless other acts had to do those things, of course, because of X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so. To, to be seen, to be on film, to even have any type of recognition that they were tap dancers. So that's a whole nother thing, but still having to keep that in mind and keeping those principles in mind. More entertainment yeah. to them, the actual pure uh, yeah. rhythm, yeah. Which, which only probably some of the elite could understand. You know, like you have to be challenged in order to really relish the rhythmic counter, counter rhythms and so on and so forth. Yeah. Versus someone doing uh, great gymnastics uh, yeah. is very visually appealing yeah. and entertaining. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I would agree. And that's what what the drew masses. the crowd, For yeah, the that's what, what the masses would enjoy. But also, they would enjoy Bojangles, but that was because of the big eyes and the, and the big grins, but you know, because of X, Y, and Z. So, um, I guess that but, happens in all kinds of, all genres of dance, I would say, or art forms. Well, tap dance really has had a different type of a struggle, of course, with the, um, you know, with the time of the minstrel shows and Bojangles breaking, breaking the, what was it, the two-color rule? No? Is that real? You know what I mean? That's a very heavy thing. That's a historical thing. So uh, especially in, in here in the States, uh, tap dancing has had to make a little, like, just different hurdles as, as well as every other genre. But tap dancing uh, is, is, is a lot for me to incorporate when creating anything. And just talk about you and your work now, maybe, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, I think my work has really expanded a whole lot. And uh, one, of course, since I had to uh, dance or I had to present works to diverse audiences. So my movement vocabulary really en enlarged. And also I was influenced by seeing what the other art forms were, like ballet and other contemporary dance that I saw. And also I studied... Um, deeper into my own roots, which gave all these, all these dance vocabulary, which I had not known about, which I had the opportunity to study more, which I delved into and figured out and uh, created more movements, which really enhanced my presentation on the stage. And also, content is a very important thing. What is the content that we are going to present on the stage, which would immediately be appealing to the audience. Social issues, for example, um, environmental preservation is a simple thing, for example, or lack of water, or lack of air, or lack of you know, sensitivity to each other, the values. So these are things that I explore a lot which make more sense to the audiences of today, rather than uh, dancing about 
even though we do mythology of, uh, which is based on Indian mythology, Indian, Indian scriptures and so on and so forth, our poems are very, very value based and very spiritual in content, but then I translate them to the, or, or translate them in a way in dance which can be much more meaningful to the audiences here. Even though the narratives are very interesting, storytelling is very an in interesting aspect of this dance form. Um, talking about demons and you know how they transform into gods and how they become one with each other and how they uh, bring about um, awareness of good values and so on and so forth by uh, using hand gestures which are codified and expressions and emotions which are already very universal. It's very easy to communicate. So I look at it as a dance theater form which is meant for, I, we, when I say I, my works, uh, we usually tend to make an impact uh, try at least to bring about an awareness of, of a social value. So awareness of whether we can transcend that to a higher spiritual level. That's what we try to do. Not to be preachy, but then to bring about a value. That's how when Sahridaya came about. So my thinking is always towards that, always. So uh, I think my work is much more, um, and it keeps evolving. I wouldn't say that it stops here because it's like a river, it keeps evolving. And I don't know if I see Jumani's work, I might be, of course, we do have a lot of tap, uh, not exactly tap, but our rhythm is very, and we wear bells on our ankles and we tap our feet and you know that. So we have counter rhythms and we revel in it as well. So that's purely for, enter not, yeah, for entertainment as well as it's very mathematical. So uh, my work keeps evolving, I would say. Thanks, yeah. I would, mine does too, everyone should keep evolving. But uh, my, my previous work has just been like using those uh, historical tap dance things, or those things that exist like the Tree of Hope or the Hoofers or uh, the Shim Sham. Using those things like, I guess, I'm trying to think of what would be like a basic standard thing for another genre, like I guess like the Nutcracker. I'm not sure. Another Nutcracker seems so standard, uh, but that's besides the point. But using those things to create some type of feeling uh, within my dancing uh, that will hopefully say something or relay a message or express a statement. But now I am really into an intelligent sound. I, I've spent a little time around Savion Glover and seeing him in a room and on the stage or outside of the room, he can deliver an intelligent sounds sometimes. Um, and I only say sometimes because sometimes he might not feel up to it. But because he is Savion Glover, the audience will enjoy it most times, you know? Um, so I am trying to, I guess, break open everyone's ears or break open everyone's eyes from you know, just Savion Glover being the tap dance rhythm maker or the tap dance musician. Not saying that, you know, the tap dancers now want to have their back towards the audience or want to be looking down or anything like that that he has done in the past or has been shamed for, but really uh, having an intelligent musical interpretation towards their tap dancing and being able to create musically with musicians, any musicians, and having that respect from musicians is something that I'm still working towards uh, finding. I've been dancing with musicians, live musicians, ever since I graduated from high school, or maybe even in high school I was jamming with musicians, and even hired uh, some of my favorite musicians from Chicago, but I still don't believe that they can hear 
uh, what's being played with the tap dancing. But if, if Savion Glover was in the room, I'm sure they would really try to be in tune with whatever he wanted them to do. So I don't know, it's, I'm saying a lot, but I'm hoping I'm making sense. It's really just this intelligent rhythm thing happening. I love the word intelligent rhythm. <laughs> I think what he's trying to, uh, I think if I'm uh, thinking right, what you're trying to say is that that sense of not everyone is a sakhradaya in terms of, of uh, art. You know, everyone just, and we call it rasa which is um, a very, very unique word, which is something which just touches uh, an aesthetic sense. So um, I think that's what you're trying to say. Have you heard of the Katha tap? Kathak and tap? Yep. You've, you've seen that? Samuels yeah, and Chitresh. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that is an innovative, um, beautiful, uh, fantastic phenomena, I think, that happened on the stage, yeah, right? Great. Yeah. yeah. So th this is a classical dance form called Kathak, where they use just footwork and just rhythm. So they yeah. don't really delve on, well, you know, they go into geometry of movement and hand gestures and expressions. But it's all about rhythm. So they wear bells and they just um, tap out various, um, and then you guys wear tap shoes. I mean, and that's you know, and. To come, I, I don't know whether they had, I think they had uh, the tabla. I don't know whether they had a drummer to, I think they, have they both. had both. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they had yeah. both, yeah. You yeah. know. Uh, I mean, that, that was just phenomenal to me. I mean, that was just fantastic. And both are great artists, you know, and to be, d and they, they toured all over the world. They, they went to India and it was very successful. I don't know whether you've heard about this, Shirley. Yeah. So I'm hearing you know, all kinds of things with regards to innovation. Some of them are about staying a course on a very specific path and moving further along in that course. Some of them are about collisions with other forms and other sounds and other ideas. Some of them are about pushing out from where you are because you have an urge to be further out into, into a new space and wondering whether that space is, uh, is, ha has left too much behind. Yeah. Or, or whether you've gone far enough. Like all of those questions seem like they're in both of the forms that you're describing. Um, yes. Uh, I just had the um, opportunity to interview um, one of Catherine Dunham's uh, solo. Uh, I'm not American. I don't shout. Sorry. <laughs> um, so um, Catherine Dunham's dance uh, solo. Um, so, and she actually took over uh, the role of um, solo dancer uh, from Catherine Dunham and she was talking about growing up in Memphis where she would, um, you know, use a hammer to uh, flatten the tin, tin cans and then glue the tin to the bottom of her shoes uh, and she would perform, you know, in the four 30s and 40s. And Catherine Dunham came out of Chicago. She studied anthropology at the UIC. And when we talk about this evolution of uh, political and social practice, and I think it's really fascinating to look at how um, Catherine Dunham, through her practice within the rehearsal space, within the ensemble space, actually empowered, you know, it was about empowering a new generation to create change. And um, the person, Othella Dallas, that I interviewed in Switzerland uh, was also best friends with Arthur Kitt, who came, because she came up through Catherine Dunham's uh, dance company. And, um, you know, it's really kind of fascinating, fascinating history how, you know, innovation in actual practice within the rehearsal can also bring about that spir spiritual transcendence that you're talking about. 
All right, we need to, uh, this is so great, and we hope that the conversations will spill out and go to the Fine Arts Cafe afterwards or whatever and continue. Um, but I wanna make sure that we also fulfill the other reason why we've come here, which is to let you know about the Chicago Dance Makers Forum Lab Artist Program. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly tell you about how it began so you have a sense of where, where its origins were, why it was created, and who was responsible for uh, making it happen, and, um, and then, uh, what the opportunity is. So uh, Chicago Dance Makers Forum is 15 years old this year. Um, it was initiated, uh, and I think it's important to say these things because I, sometimes I think when you're practicing in the studio and you're working extensively at your own technique and practice and making, that you're not necessarily aware of some of the other waves of, of things that are occurring that influence uh, what's available to you or what isn't available to you. Um, so in 2000, I think two or, or so, the Chicago Community Trust, which is a large philanthropic institution that uh, makes grants and um, tries to fill needs of all sorts in Chicago, uh, uh, saw a, a moment where they thought it was a good idea to uh, look at the field of dance. They felt that it was a, a moment for um, an infusion of energy and funding support and um, and interest in the field of dance, and it was called the Excellence in Dance Initiative. And the trust uh, at, with Sarah Solitaroff Merkin uh, at its helm um, convened a group of leaders in the field of, the dan of dance from all over the city to talk about what the challenges and the opportunities they saw were um, and, and try to get a picture of, of the things they didn't know. And uh, through that, several demonstration projects were created to address certain concerns or potentials one of which was the Chicago Dance Makers Forum. Um, they, uh, there were several leaders who felt that individual, more than, that, in, that individual choreographers, choreographers sort of working outside of the major companies or uh, um, although many of individual choreographers do direct companies, uh, that those artists were not getting enough stimulation support or interaction, that at a certain point people would reach a certain level of, of, uh, in, their, in their artistic development and then they would either atrophy uh, artistically or leave town. And uh, so it felt like there was a moment in, in an artistic trajectory that it was important, to, a vulnerable moment, that it was important to inject with uh, some cash support and to build uh, relationships between artists and to, to help people feel more connected. Um, uh, to combat isolation. So the Chicago Community Trust invested uh, in three years worth of support for the, these grants called the Chicago Dance Makers Forum Lab Artist Grants. The artists uh, who, are, who receive the grants are also supported by leaders from a number of organizations that are, are stakeholders in the field of dance. Um, they it were called the consortium. Chicago Dance Makers Forum is still consortium led uh, by people from uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Dance Center of Columbia College Chicago, uh, uh, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, and University of Illinois at Chicago. Did I miss anybody? Is that the whole thing? Um, and uh, uh, that's, so leaders from each of those uh, organizations meet with the artists, and the artists are also meeting with one another to, throughout a year of research sort of extended research and ultimately the development of a work during the course of their grant year. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, an, a, a unique program in that it, it uh, emphasizes an extended period of research. Um, it's not specific to outcome, although we, artists are expected to present a work that's the result of their extended year of research and development. Um, but it's really process-based and it's about artistic development. Uh, people, Sean will tell you a little bit more about the specifics of how, how to apply, how the application process works. Um, but the, the purpose really is to, um, not to just uh, add another line to your, to your general operating budget if you have a company or whatever, but to think really about, uh, it's, a, it's a grant to an individual um, maker and, it, and it's an investment in an artist's uh, artistic development. The, the, the hope is that through the course of the year, um, the exchange between artists, the, just the little bit more time that that extra cash might hope to hopefully allow you, um, will help you as an artist to build a, a 
refill your creative reservoir, um, be stimulated, be uh, 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 questioned, be um, uh, supported, and, um, and to move forward into the next version flowering of your artistic self. So Sean, uh, what was the name of that grant? I beg your pardon? The name of the grant, what is this? The Chicago oh. Dance Makers Forum Lab Artist oh, Grant. Lab artist. Okay. Yeah. It's the grant, it's this, it's, the, right. Yeah. The question was, was it only yeah. in Chicago? It's for artists, yeah, it's for artists who live here, and it needs to have at least one expression, presentation that occurs in Chicago. Um, so I'll just go into a couple logistics about the grant. Um, we have two application work sessions, um, one at the Logan Center for the Arts and one at Ruth Page Center um, later this month and in February. So any artist who is interested in applying can bring their materials, talk to other artists, look over and have conversations with artists about the work. Um, even if someone is deciding that maybe this isn't the year for this particular grant, you're welcome to come to those sessions as well and just talk to artists about your resume, your work samples, about actually how you present yourself and talk to yourself. So um, those are coming up and then we have one more session like this next week, which is innovation in Chicago dance and disability. Um, and that is um, at uh, UIC and the information's on our website um, with our partners there. So those events are leading up through this process and with that preliminary application being due February 6th and it's a two-part application. So the preliminary is due in February. Um, we usually have approximately 55-0-ish um, applicants in the preliminary round. Um, approximately 15 are chosen by the panel to become finalists. Uh, staff, Ginger and myself, uh, meet with all of the finalists um, to really look over their second application. That final application is due, it's down here, um, in April. So there's a little bit of time. It's announced in May or June with a Lab Artist Awards celebration at the Arts Club, and, and that's in July, and so the year, the lab year, would, become, would begin in that summer, um, after July. So, it's a, it's, so this year, um, 2017, was the first time in the program's history that six artists were selected, one of which is Jumani, so congratulations again. Um, and we are happy to announce that in 2018, for the 15th anniversary, we will once again have six lab artist grants. Um, because it's our 15th anniversary, there's also a number of other opportunities. We'll have um, dance dialogues, which is dialogues between artists, um, movement-based embodied dialogues. Um, and those, uh, that explanation that will be announced um, with our partner at the MCA of what, when those are and when those will happen. And we'll have uh, performances by artists ongoing, um, happening even just this month at the Cultural Center and a number of other events happening um, throughout the 15th anniversary. Um, so please check out chicagodancemakers.org. It has the link to the application. It has a lot more information about eligibility, criteria, and, and also my contact. So if people have specific questions about um, residency, where you know I live at this zip code, does this count, any of those, or um, I'm not sure if this is for me, or I have some questions about the application. All of that information and all of the events are listed on the website. So, um, so that is the process. Um, and if people have more questions, just to let us know. I want to interject yeah. one more thing. I want to make sure that you understand this is a grant, a $15,000 grant that is awarded to up to six artists uh, this coming year. And it's a two-step process, preliminary. If you're selected for a finalist, you might possibly become one of those six artists. So it's a competitive grant. It's uh, for people who have developed a trajectory in their work and are ready now to go deeper or further or turn a corner. So it's, it's not your first grant that you're gonna apply for. It's not the first time you're seeking support for your work. It's, it's, a, it's a, for a, a uh, maturing, uh, a maturing artist who is e ready to go make works of greater depth 
or scale or struggle or, or grapple with some of the questions about, about where do I go, how far do I press, who do I engage with, how do I want my, my work to develop. So um, that's really who it's for. And, uh, um, and it, the other piece of it is that uh, artists, as I mentioned, meet with the consortium members and with one another throughout the year. So part of the commitment to participating is that, you're, that you want to get something out of those dialogues, that you want to be part of that, that you feel that you have something to bring to that table, and that you also have something that you, you can take from that table. Those are also really important. And also, if you're going to be out of town for eight months of the year, that's not going to work. So you have to be present for those meetings as well. So just a couple brass tacks there. Um, so I think we can open to a couple questions and then maybe some last words or <laughs> other things. Um, maybe some last, and then if we want to do a little resource sharing and we can talk about other opportunities that we know in the city. Um, but do we want to open up if there's questions about specifically the Lab Artist Program, about their experience with the program or their work in general? So. Questions? Do we fulfill no lingering thoughts? Okay. I'd love to know what the lab thanks. Uh, I'd love to know what the lab artist award allowed each of you to do as a lab artist in your own work, in collaborations, and how it's informing what you're making or made. I think we we were two thousand four. And uh, we each, I know, I know that Chita came and saw some of my work and gave some feedback. I used to go to show this, um, I've come to come to show this um, studio while we were working at the dance center. Remember Shirley? So this was way back in 2004. So I think it was very, very uh, useful for us when we saw each other's work while we were working in our own studios, which was important. And then when another artist comes in and, you know, I've had conversations with Ginger about, what do you think about this, do you remember? So I think all that is very, very good for the artists, as well as the, we used to have these sessions every month, or a sure. session, I don't think every other month. I think it's every other month. Yeah, and that was a great thing, because we came back from our, um, I, know, I knew that Eduardo, uh, remember Eduardo was the other one, Yeah. he was just studying, he was just, uh, just studying. Studying. he was just working on his book, and was just, a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was actually doing any work at the studio, but Shirley and I were, and I don't know whether that was Lane was, well, I'm not sure whether Lane did, Lane was also in the same year. I think all that helped because there was uh, so many of you that Bonnie was there, and there was uh, Peter, uh, Peter Tom, who used to question us, like, you know, question our line of what we were doing. So that gave us, and sometimes it, I felt, hmm, what are they talking about, you know, that kind of thing. But then all those things really, all those questions or all those comments that they gave really helped me, at least, in um, my work as, a, as it evolved. Uh, for me, I'm in the mix. I'm in the middle of it. So, but right now, it's, it's so much. It's... Uh, it's so much of a support system, even in the conversation uh, with, the other, with the other artists or the consortium members. But I think what it is really creating for me is a, a, a year of, I guess, science, a, a year of really being in the lab, bringing these dancers here and saying, hey, try this, you know, we're gonna, oh, what are we saying, and ask questions, and really, and really uh, figure out what are gonna be the next progressions uh, of your career for, for this year, as, as far as a choreographer, as far as an artist, uh, and, you know, and, and uh, I guess, grounding grounding us but 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 uplifting us in 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 a way that is i just open i guess that is open for creativity and i say grounding us because of the consortium members uh different individuals who either have 
uh, historical placement or were around or are around or in certain institutions and can share uh, lots of other information from other sides of this of, of the same genre sometimes. I don't know, there's just so much informa information. I feel like I'm in, I'm in school again. Um, but it's, it's for tap dancing, right, but it's for tap dancing, but it's not necessarily with tap dancers. And that has never really happened for me in my tap dance career. It's always been with tap dancers or with other people who are affiliated with tap dance, not just the genre of dance in general, so. Yeah, that's the most important yeah. thing. If you're, you're, you know, interacting with so many different artists, and so that's the it's like a lot. You're yeah, really yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thanks so much for those words, you all. That's yeah. really it's exciting to hear to, from my perspective because you know it's always been interesting to, to see what happens with a group. We we select artists on their basis of their individual, the strength of their individual work. But then these artists do go through a year together with one another and, and, and different things happen every year because each year it's a different group of people and how they connect with one another and what other people, what they each bring into the circle from where really uh, you know, makes each year distinct and uh, fascinating. So. Um, Project Shirley. Um, when, before I left San Francisco and moved, he, I moved out of San Francisco, a group of us heard that Ruth St. Dennis was performing in Los Angeles. So we got in a car and drove to Los Angeles. And I witnessed this performance of Ruth St. Dennis sitting on a bench, and the group was out here, and she did the whole piece with her back. She could, she could barely move. But what she did with that back and how she moved that spine, it was like, oh my God. It was just breathtaking to watch that. And I, I think of, to a certain extent, that's what the Oldenburg exhibit did. How, how, you, when, how you totally go to a, to a place that is so fresh and so daring just to do a whole work with your back in a small studio. I never forgot that. That's courage. First and foremost, I want to say thank y'all for being here and thank you for sharing. Um, so many thoughts. Okay, so one, articulation is the key to dance for me and the way that you have separate worlds of dance and that language still connects and just carries through is phenomenal to me. Um, so my question is, do you find yourself throughout your dance career, throughout your life, in certain cycles that may have gotten you to where you are now? Uh, absolutely. Um, for, for me, the, the cycle really ha has been trusting the dance. I remember one quote from Roy Hargrove watching something on the net, and he said, you know, as long as you take care of the art form, the art form will take care of you. And I've tried to keep that mentality, you know, since I was a, a young man, and literally that's just been how things have moving, have, have been moving, staying prayerful and staying connected uh, spiritually really ha it has been moving like that, the art form, take care of me, as long as I'm being respectful and taking care of the art form as well. I really can't just say, you know, I've auditioned here and I got this, and I applied here and I got this. No, you know, straight out of high school, I got a call to come to New York, you know, and then after New York, I got a call to come overseas to do a show in Paris, and then after that, I got a call to uh, hang with Rasta Thomas, and that's a random name. I don't know if you know Rasta Thomas, a great ballet dancer, but being called by him, a ballet dancer, to come do a tap show that was in Germany. And then after that, you know, just different things just kind of occurred because I'm just trying to take care of, of, of tap dancing. Really that. And when I'm, when, when I'm, whenever I'm tap dancing, I'm just 
trying to keep that in mind uh, in any type of forward movement because that's how it's been uh, keeping me happy and keeping me balanced so far. And for me, it's very similar in the sense, I think all art, all true artists have to be dependent on what happens. They don't think about what is it going to get me. It's just that they work at their art and things just seem to fall into place organically. And that's what happened to me all along. So I just believe in myself and my art and it just moves me. And then as it moves me, it just get, takes me to places and it just gets me to what I have to do. And tomorrow this and tomorrow, day after tomorrow that. And then one feeds the other. And I think it's all about uh, your own life experiences as an artist. If you just you know, go deep into yourself, and allow yourself to let go and feel the world around you. It just feeds you and um, you come to that point, I guess. Yeah. It's a cycle. Yeah. And one last thing, taking care of the art could mean teaching four-year-olds how to tap dance. Oh, yeah. Could mean a year just in your basement working just on your feet and not making any money, you know. So, you know, that can also be a, a, a sense for me um, and for, a sense for an artist taking care of the art form, you know, really sharing, really giving back with an honest respect. So, in other words, uh, I mean, all I've been hearing Jamani say throughout, which <laughs> fantastic, is what we all teach. I mean, our great gurus teach us to do. Like my teacher would always say, you know, don't expect any rewards. Keep working at whatever, wherever you're working. So I think spiritually it'll enhance you, and that's what Jumani is saying. Being authentic, being hardworking, and uh, just being doing, not worrying about what is it going to give you. Yeah. What award is it going to give you? Yeah, the art is the award, right? <laughs> so I'm going to use that segue in talking about teachers to just take a minute to sort of totally shake everything up and uh, get to, for us all to get to know each other just very briefly. So if you just will stand up, I know, radical move, right? Stand up and just take a minute, walk around the room, find a person that you have not met before, not and met before. that you've not met before, introduce yourself, and then I'm gonna ask you, and this, it's totally okay if you're not a dancer to do this because you can teach some other thing, right? But name one of your teachers, and teach the person one thing they taught you. A gesture, or if you're an actor, a, f a l intonation of something. Like just a little, t little tiny bite. Okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm Dana. So since we're together, and, uh, and all of you are, uh, many of you are artists, and you live in the city, and you've taken advantage of different kinds of opportunities here, and you know different things than one another, and you have the ability to teach them to each other, <laughs> which is awesome. I think we just want to take a few minutes to do some resource sharing. Uh, and Sean, you can lead this. We usually bring post-its, which I forgot. I forgot to bring the big post-its, so we'll have to just talk to each other. It's an amazing concept, right? <laughs> um, so the idea, one thing that we do as well as present this lab artist grant opportunity and have public events, um, one thing we love to do is to share other resources in the city. Um, so maybe the lab artist grant is not for you. Maybe it's not for you this year. Uh, maybe you're too busy or you can't get to the public events. Um, so on our social media, we tend to share as many other opportunities, spaces, uh, residencies, other grant opportunities for individual artists, and our, who we support are grant dance makers, choreographers, um, those working in making dance, um, which is very specific. And so we'd love to just maybe pass the mic a little bit and share some of the resources that come to mind, um, opportunities in the city, other grants, residencies, places, um, and then we're gonna start to collate those and have those available online as like a living resource. Um, but I'll just kick it off and then we can pass. Um, 
Lynx Hall has been a partner to us overall. They have a number of residency opportunities and presentation opportunities as well um, for a subsidized cost or free um, or getting paid to do it. Um, and then we have a number of community partners that have residencies. Uh, one of our community partners is Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network. They have an artist in residence program. And another community partner is HCL. Um, high Concept Labs. They also have an artist residency program. Um, so those are a, a couple opportunities in the city. Um, if anyone wants to talk about rehearsal space that's available, I know we're here at American Rhythm Center, which is a place for classes and rehearsal. Um, so if anyone wants to just name or list other resources in the city, um, we'll finish on that and just uh, make sure you get a survey on the way out. And thank you all for being here.